All right. So Mike Duffy, it's a well, first of all, thank you for joining us. Sober is dope. It's a pleasure to have you on our podcast. It means a lot to me for you taking the time out your day to join us. Look, it, it is a real pleasure. You are a man with a mission, and you have a very important mission. So it's my pleasure today to help you with your purpose. I know that the people that are looking at us and listening to us will have life-changing knowledge and wisdom. So this is going to be fun. We're going to have some laughs, and we're going to have a great conversation. There we go. There we go. So, Mike, um, the Sober is Dope podcast, so you know, we, we definitely are vested in being there for anyone that may be struggling with addiction, anyone that may be dealing with mental health. When um, our theme, um, our ongoing theme is usually happiness. So I think you're the best person in the field to talk to us about happiness especially being that we're in this COVID environment and this pandemic environment. So before we start, I just want to say thank you again. You're the founder of the Happiness Hall of Fame and an expert on happiness and money. And you talk about the science of happiness a lot in your work. So um, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how, what, what brought you to this the happiness? Talking sure. about happiness. So I have written five books on happiness. I started my 501c3, the Happiness Hall of Fame, to recognize, celebrate, and encourage people and organizations, just like you, Pop, right, right. to help other people get happier. That's the mission statement of my life. I am here to help other people get happier. That's what brings me joy. That's why I get up in the morning, right? right. So how it all started, when I was 17, I lost my mom to cancer and it only took three months. And here I am, a very happy kid in New York City, born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens. <laughs> and all of a sudden, a great depression fell over me, something I had never experienced before. So I said, how do I get out of this depression? So I got a degree in psychology. I read everything that I could get my hands on in order to be happier. I went to lectures, you name it. I sought out people. And through that process, I gained my happiness back, right? And then about nine years ago, with the advent of the internet, you are just absolutely drenched every time you open up your phone or your laptop at just how bad things are in the world, right? But that's not true. Things are great in the world. Why? Because we're breathing. Right? Because we have a purpose. Right. Our purpose is to love each other and to enjoy this beautiful life that God gave us. Right? right. COVID has been tough. There's no lie on that. Right? But there have been beautiful pockets throughout all of this. There have been good things that have come about through COVID. And, you know, I, I started doing some research on you and your work. Before I got on the call, I saw one of your videos with Dr. Kelly. And, you know, you were talking about self-talk, you were talking about recovery. And uh, while I'm not a uh, addiction expert, there is a lot of overlap between what we both do, happiness and, and sobriety. Yes. So, you know, I, I'm sober now about seven and a half years. And thank you, thank you. Now, it, I, I have a very unique story. Uh, alcohol was never really a problem in my life, but I did drink. Now, I have two wonderful kids, 15 and a half and 11. And, uh, you know, I would maybe drink, let's say, once a week, maybe three times a month, right? But uh, so it wasn't really that much of a problem with me. But one day... I'm working out. I live in, I live about 25 miles south of San Francisco. And my phone starts blowing up. And I'm like, what's going on? And I have three sisters. And my youngest sister is texting me to pray for her oldest daughter, who's three and a half. And the doctor just told her to take her child home to die. Because she had stage four terminal cancer with hard lumps in her lungs. 
And I said to myself, Lord, if you will let this child live, I will give up alcohol for the rest of my life. And I came home and I told my wife and she wasn't happy. Right? It wasn't the reaction that I was looking for. But if we fast forward to today, my niece is 10 and a half years old. She is cancer free. That which a death sentence of only three weeks turned around. And when I did this, I called up my friend, Dr. Fred Luskin from Stanford University. He's a best-selling author. He's the author of Forgive for Good, Forgive for Life, a luminary in the field of psychology. And uh, he says, well, Mike, there's no loophole in that contract. So <laughs> I can tell you as a result of my sobriety, I've written five books. I started a, a chat, you know, a 501c3. I've met Muhammad Ali, Steph Curry, you know, I, at Stanford University, I've taught courses on happiness in other universities. Um, my life went from pretty much ordinary and in the sober life, when you have no escape, when you have no outlet, all of a sudden, all of your creativity can be realized with no hangovers to keep you down. Right. So what do you think of that, Bob? I think that's awesome. I think, well, one, um, God bless your niece. I'm so happy for mm -hmm. her recovery. That's such a miraculous story. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I always say sober life is better. That's yeah. my stance, right? Because you're more focused. You're more happy, right? Alcohol is a depressant. People drink alcohol when they're in pain and they have trauma and they drink it in hopes to feel better and it usually winds up making them feel worse and yeah. unhappy. And um, I was unhappy when I was drinking and I was trying to drink to deal with depression, sadness and loss. Mm -hmm. And it just was this devastating rabbit hole that never ended. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm so happy and the health benefits are insurmountable. So. Yeah. You know, God bless you and thank you for taking that stance because you do have a platform and sobriety is something that I think we should share with the world, right? Oh, I, you know, there's, there's not enough people talking about sobriety. Right. You know, what COVID was is a big drink fest, right? Unfortunately, right. people drinking by themselves in their homes, right? Correct, correct. I, I, and one of the bad things that's going to come out of this whole COVID thing is there's going to be a lot more alcoholics, unfortunately. Unfortunately, because it's celebrated over social media, you know, oh, it's wine Wednesday, it's five o'clock somewhere, it's time to drink, you know, and that's that's a real unfortunate situation. And I think there's a link between boredom, unhappiness, lack of creativity, um, sadness and alcoholism. That's why we're seeing this influx of alcoholics during this environment. People are um, they just get stuck. And we're in the business of helping people get unstuck, especially when it comes to happiness. Um, I talk a lot about seasonal affective disorder, people being sad in general. So we can't talk about happiness unless we try to shed light on sadness. And so many people are sad these days and because of mental health, depression, anxiety. And you talk about the science of happiness and you also talk about the anxiety crisis. Can you elaborate for us a little bit on the science of happiness and how that relates to anxiety? So what I'm most known for is my happiness formula. So if you're listening right now, I'd like you to take out a piece of paper and I'd like you to draw these letters. P plus P equals H. Purpose plus progress equals happiness. So I have a wonderful State Farm agent and he saw me speak and he's like, Mike, he goes, when I retire, I know what my happy place is gonna be. He says, I'm gonna get a place by the beach and I am gonna drink from nine o'clock in the morning till the sun goes down. I won't have to work and I'll have, and I'm like, no, 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 stop, stop. Like, That's not gonna be your happy place. It's gonna be a place of misery. Please right, take it right. from me. Get that picture out of your head. That's not why I'm speaking to people. Right, right, right. right. So we all have a purpose. That's the reason why most people slide into drug addiction, slide into alcoholism, is because they, they haven't identified their purpose. Now, how do you identify your purpose? 
and you can have multiple purposes. So on that sheet of paper, write down the purpose of your, of your life. Now, for me, one of my purposes is to be a great husband to my wife. The other is to be a great father to my children. The other is to be a great financial advisor to my clients. And I'm a much better financial advisor the last seven and a half years because I never have hangovers. I'm always clear, right? There is nothing clouding my judgment. So those are your purposes. And then next to it, write down how you can make progress in your purpose. Well, I decided a long time ago, it was much cheaper to take my wife out for date night every Saturday night than it was to hire a divorce lawyer. Mm. So that's so when I did this a long time ago, I said, okay, I'm going to have date night every Saturday night. There will be no excuses. I will, I will hire the babysitter. Right. My wife can pick the movie and whatever, you know, uh, restaurant she wants to go to before I might. I have a fantastic marriage. That was one of the greatest things I ever did. You know, for, for progress under my kids, I've taught my kids, I've coached them in every sport they've ever been in, right? And that's, that's been wonderful. And then, you know, for financial advising, uh, I, I opened up my own firm three years ago, Happiness Wealth Management. And then that way, we're on the same side of the table. I used to work for one of the biggest investment houses on the street. But as an independent fiduciary, we sit on the same side of the table and I can look at, regardless of you know, who it is, what the best advice out there and products for them. So everybody needs to sit down and say, okay, what are my purposes? How do I make progress? Because it's through that you end up in happiness. Not through drinking, not through smoking a little weed, that's quote unquote harmless or CBD or all of this stuff. It's action. Right. It's the action. You have to grab life by the lapels and yes. say, I'm here for a reason. Right, right. And help people. And help so people. I, have a, I have a homeless outreach that gives me great joy. Six mornings a week, I go out and I look for homeless people, which unfortunately today is not hard at all. And I go out and I'll pray with them right on the street. I'll support them financially. I know their names. I know what drugs they're on. And I point them to where they can get help. And that brings me, that's how I start my day. You know, I'm not the most physically fit person. That's not really my bag. But my bag is to help people. Right. So that's what brings me joy. I love it. I love it. I think there's no greater joy or purpose than service. And I learned that. That's one of the ways... I maintain my recovery and happiness because the podcast and the Sober is Dope movement is all a part of service, right? Um, and I, I started it to give of myself and to pay my life forward. And I also talk about a lot on the podcast, creativity, um, mm -hmm. as far as aligning with your purpose, finding something to, that you love, mm -hmm. finding something that you love to do. And if that's in line with helping other people, then you will find fulfillment. Um, I want to talk about Abraham Maslow real quick, um, the um, uh, uh, really good psychiatrist who talked about the five hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And what was fascinating for me, there was a link between happy and people being unhappy and happy when they was kind of out of alignment with one of these five needs being physical needs, right? Making sure you're financially settled, you have food, water, and the basic physiological needs, safety, making sure you have a safe place and a safe environment and then love and being part of uh, being accepted to a greater group, a greater love relationships and having that in alignment. And that brings you to fulfillment and self-esteem, right? And what happens is when we look at the fulfillment part, if people don't have the other three parts, the physiological needs, if they don't feel safe, if they don't have love, or if they don't feel accomplished in their life, they don't have that fulfillment and they have lower self-esteem, which makes them really unhappy. And that's hard for them to get to that fifth stage, which is self-actualization, where you have this, like that you are a great example of what I consider self-actualized. You're at this point in your life, you have a clear picture, you know your purpose, you have success, you're helping other people, you had your awe moment, and now you're paying it forward. Um, what do we say to people right now who's at rock bottom 
who can't really see any light at the end of the tunnel. They may be coming out of a hard addiction. They may be in a hard addiction. They may be part of this whole pandemic environment where they unemployed, lost money, family can't eat. What do we say with someone at rock bottom where they're so emotionally crutched, they can't even begin to fathom the idea of happiness? This is what I have to say, that God loves you. Amen. And that your test will be your testimony. Maybe one day you'll be on the Sober is Dope podcast or something similar, right? Maybe someday you'll be helping people. You'll be the person that, that reaches out to other people to lift them up out of this abyss, out of the muck and mire that currently you're suffering from. But let me tell you this. I have studied this extensively. I have studied some of the most successful people. I have met them. I have managed money for them. If you think that your story is so unique to this history of humanity, it's not. In fact, this is your starting point. You know, a big influence on my life was Dr. Wayne Dyer. Now, Dr. Wayne Dyer uh, taught at St. John's. Pop, where do you live? I'm a fellow New Yorker. I live in Queens. <laughs> where, what part of Queens? Wood, Woodhaven, Woodhaven. Woodhaven. I grew up in Elmhurst. I went to All right, there we go. Life. There we go. I'm from Brooklyn originally, yeah. but I now currently live in Queens. Yes. I tell you, the, the best pizza in the world, Rose's <laughs> Pizza in Aspen. Nice. He knows nice. pizza in Elmhurst on Broadway. Nice. I tell nice. you, you spoiled. I miss it. Um, <laughs> but but Dr. Wayne Dyer was was suffering badly uh, from unforgiveness. His father was a terrible man. Uh, he grew up uh, in foster care. His mother simply couldn't afford to take care of him. And he set the record for PBS specials, 10 PBS specials, 40 books. Um, and, you know, when I, I, I'm a public speaker, so when I speak, I have certain slides on him and, and I have two quotes from, from, from Wayne. One is change your thoughts and change your life. Nice. So if you are at rock bottom right now, change your thoughts right now, you are saying, I can't do this. I can't do this. Life is pain. Stop it. Reverse it. Say, I can do this. Life is beautiful. Life is worth living. Even if you have to lie to yourself, lie to yourself, reprogram your inner thoughts. Your brain is a computer. What you put into it comes out. If you're putting the thoughts of self-defeat, what do you think is going to happen? Okay. Now, this is not just me saying this. This is so many people, successful people, self-actualized people throughout history have suffered the same terrible things you're going through right now. So, and the second thing is, do it now. You only have this chance now. Now, I was supposed to, uh, I was supposed to give the Happiness Hall of Fame award to Wayne Dyer in Phoenix. And I was gonna meet him in Phoenix. And the week before I was supposed to meet him, he died of a heart attack in his sleep. Mm -hmm. So I had been, you know, I, I'd met Wayne before and okay. he was very encouraging to me. Right. But this was the time that we're gonna spend some time together. And I was looking forward to it. So a man that I looked up to my whole life when I was finally get the opportunity to spend some significant time with him like that. Right. So we're not guaranteed tomorrow. So make the best of today. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite Wayne Dyer quotes, if I can remember it correctly, I might have to paraphrase it. Um, when you when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. It Amen. was something it was something along that line. And, and, and that hit me when um, about eight years ago, when I first found my sobriety and I was traveling to Massachusetts to go see my girlfriend. I had a little free time from the rehab I was in. I was in an outpatient so I could leave on the weekend sometime. And I was listening to one of his lectures. And when he said that, it really hit me because when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. And it's so dynamic. Um, being able to twist your, change your thoughts, transform the way, you, you know, turning something negative and being optimistic and turn it into a positive. Um, I talk about optimism and hope a lot. 
yeah. right? Being optimistic, even in your darkest moment, having hope and faith and mixing that faith with works, like they say in the Bible, right? So you can have faith, but you mix it with action. Um, and you talk about, in your, in your teachings, how does God play a role within the theme of happiness along the lines of faith and hope um, for, in general? How does um, God play out in your world sure. and in your life? Well, in the good book, it says faith without works is dead. There we right? go. There so we go. works, work, work, work. You got to work, right? <laughs> it's not, work. Like, some people think like, oh, you're going to read my book. You're going to eat donuts on your couch and you're going to get struck with a bolt of happiness lightning. It's not going to do that, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and that's for a reason. The reason is, you know, look, when God created us, he could have put wind up robots on the face of the earth and we never did anything wrong, but we have freedom of choice. And along with that freedom of choice is the obligation to do the right thing. Now, no matter how down in the, in the muck you are right now, you know what the right thing is, right? That's your intuition, right? right. So you know what I'm saying is true. So do it, right? Because we have a choice every day. Am I continuing to drink alcohol and my wife's going to leave me and I'm not going to be able to pay my bills and I'm going to come in the office smell like alcohol and I'm going to lose my job or am I going to get sober and do the right thing, right? Now, it doesn't mean that if you do the right thing every time, it's going to be easy too. But those challenges are there to strengthen us and help us learn and grow. It makes the plot of our movie more exciting. We're the heroes in our own story. Right. And when you grasp that, you can look at life as a great adventure right. and, 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 and making things happen to get to the other side. And you can look at the challenges yes. as you lay back at night and you can say, oh, I remember when I thought that was going to take me out, but I did this and it didn't. And here I am today, still breathing, still conscious, still able to make a difference, not only in my own life, but in the life of the people that I love. I love that. I love that. I was watching one of your videos and you were talking about being excited when you wake up in the morning and not pressing the alarm or making up some excuse that you have an illness, but instead being excited, right? And that's hard for a lot of people, especially if they don't, they're not working within their purpose, right? So how do we maintain happiness when we're working in an unhappy place just to keep food on the table while we're pursuing something that's purposeful in our life? Like, yeah. You need to have a plan. I'm a financial planner, right? So I, I sit down with people all the time. Where do you want to go? Okay. How much, you know, let's figure out how much you need to retire. And then we, we make investments based on what that number is, right? So we have a plan. It doesn't matter if the markets go up and down. We stick with the plan. And then eventually the sun comes out and there you are. I've been doing that for 30 years. I, I know that planning works. So your question is, how can I get to the life that I want while I'm working in a job that I don't like, right? Right. You come up with a plan. Also, you know, I was recently hired to speak to um, the Langley School District in British Columbia via Zoom. And it was the union workers that that you know sweep the floors the electricians the carpenters that work on the buildings not even the teachers and when we got to the q a section they said you know what i hear most this was the moderator who, who was the head of this is that we work repetitive jobs that a lot of us don't like how can we be happy in that kind of environment knowing that in order for us to get our pension which is the reason why we started this whole thing how can we be happy and I told the story about my Uncle Ken. Now, some men have the gift of being able to relate to children. I don't have that gift. I would say maybe one in a hundred, maybe two in a hundred men, when they enter a room and their children there, the children run over to them. It's something magnetic that, I, I, you know, it just, it's unexplainable. But my Uncle Ken had that. My Uncle Ken never made a lot of money. He was in charge of the tire department for British Airways, okay? He was in the British Army, never even got a high school degree. And he worked in the tire department, making sure that the planes had the right tires on it. 
his whole career. When he retired, he went from London to Devon, which is a beautiful little community right on the coast of Southern England. He didn't want to just be sitting around his little townhouse with his wonderful wife, who I love, my aunt Pat. And he said, you know what? I'm going to become the janitor at the local school. And all the children loved him. He would keep hard candy in his pocket. And he said, you know what? I don't really need the money to do this, but I know that I can be a blessing with these children to bring them joy and happiness, to make them laugh, and to also make sure that the kids that are being bullied will have somebody to come to. So throughout the 20 years that he did that, he, he was kind of a, a safety net for the, for the kids that were bullied in that school. Fast forward, when he's dying in the hospital, in the hospice wing of the hospital, a doctor that he took care of found him and said, oh my gosh, Ken Hardy, you know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be a doctor. He didn't leave Ken's side for two weeks. He took his vacation. He knew about how long it would take for Michael Ken to pass. And he held his hand and wouldn't leave him. And I said, for all of the workers that aren't the teachers that get all of the accolades, you, you have to understand that you're an important part of that school. Society's greatest obligation is to teach the next generation and you are a part of that. So while you're doing something that you might think is a menial job or whatever that is, understand that you can make a difference where you are. And then when you leave, you can also have something else going on. So you've got something else going on, Pop, right? You're helping people with addiction and recovery, right? So all of us have our gifts. So just focus on that gift and you know what that gift is. People have complimented you on it. You feel, you feel good when you use it. And that's what I would recommend to the folks that are stuck in a daily job. That get something else outside of that and try to get out of that dead end job because life is what you make it. I love that. I love that. On a side note, can you tell us how it how it felt meeting Muhammad Ali? Wow. Oh my goodness. Talk about happy, right? <laughs> Let me tell you something. <laughs> the presence that he had when he came into the room, you know, come on now. Uh, I'm 53. He was a superhero when I was right. growing up, right? right? And to just, you know, A, to be invited, you know, to come meet him and his wife uh, at his museum in, uh, in Kentucky. It was just, it was literally one of the, the best times of my life. And, you know, I heard stories about him. Did you know that Muhammad Ali hated boxing? No, I didn't know that. Wow. He never, he says, I've got such a pretty face. I didn't want anybody <laughs> to hurt it, right? right and he right. didn't want to beat anybody up, but he knew that with his platform, that he could inspire so many people that felt that they were the underdog, that they could achieve anything that they wanted in life. And that's why he kept on boxing. The wow. other thing, the other story that I got, which was just phenomenal, is that people would show up to his house in Los Angeles. His wife told me this story. And they would just knock on the door. Muhammad would answer the door and say, hey, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. You want to come on in? I'd be like, okay. And they would walk in. And, you know, she would tell me, she goes, you know, some of these people would get off a bus from Kansas and they got a star map and they found, you know, his address and like, oh, I'm going to go say hello to Muhammad Ali. And they'd be like, where are you from? Kansas. So oh, where are you staying? I don't know. I just got off the bus. He goes, you're staying with me. Wow. He would have people stay over the house that he never met before. Wow. That's beautiful. And then she would say, I would wait for Muhammad to get into his big Cadillac and drive away, whether he was going to lunch or dinner or an important meeting. And I would look out the window, I'd pull the blinds down and I could, I could see that he was gone. And I let you, because you know, there were so many people staying with us. I'd be like, let's say his name was Jerry. They're like, Jerry, it's time for you to leave. <laughs> and Muhammad would come back and he'd be like, where's Jerry? And she said, oh, you know, Jerry. 
<laughs> Classic Jerry, gotta go, gotta hit the road. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Wow. So you following your purpose, you doing something great to bring happiness into the world that brought you to meet all of these beautiful people. I'm so excited for the Happiness Hall of Fame. How does one become, you know, a part of the Happiness Hall of Fame or elected to be in the Happiness Hall of Fame? So I have a board of directors and, uh, you know, we, we meet from time to time and we have people that are on our slate that, you know, really have made a gigantic difference and, uh, you know, and, and we, we go from there. I love the fact that you had the Golden State Warriors, Steph Curry, those are guys, we love them. And, you know, Steph Curry always has great energy. He always seems like a happy guy. And everyone that I've read, all of the different people that's part of the Happiness Hall of Fame, you can see naturally that they're just really good people and they really bring good energy to the world. Yeah, well, uh, Steph is the second father-son induction. So Del Curry... Um, is, is in the hall. You remember Dell. He was a great basketball player. Right, right, right. What a lot of people don't know about Dell is that uh, a lot of his energy is through his foundation, which is great stuff in North Carolina, right, for the homeless. Um, but the first one was uh, Clay Thompson and Michael Thompson, first oh, of all. Wow. Right, right. And, uh, you know, those are great folks too. So, uh, and, you know, you know, it's so funny when I met Clay, you know, Clay has a stone face, right? <laughs> like, there's no, like, like he is tough. And if yeah. when you've seen him play, like in the playoffs or in the finals, he can get kneed in the head and he's right. just back up, right? He's right. just, I'm right. fine, you right. know? Right. But he is, he's such a nice person. So, you know, the, the joy of this whole thing is that you get to see people for the humans that they are. And yes. that's, that, that's been, it's been really wonderful it's not you come in with with all of these kind of like false assumptions on who they might be and then at the end of the day we're all people yes yes i love it i love it you recently did a, te a tedx talk um can you tell us a little bit about that and the, the the theme of it and congratulations by the way well thank you so the the uh the theme was uh friendship so a lot of people, and this is what's so bad about COVID is because we've been so isolated. Um, a lot of people are afraid to make new friends, especially as you get older, right? The, the number of friends that you have generally goes down as you leave school, right? right. So I just, you know, I, I'm an extrovert and I love meeting new people like yourself, Pop. I love making new Thank friends, you. right? Especially people like you, Thank cool you. people, right? <laughs> Funny Thank people, people right. with a purpose. Right. And, and that's why I came on here. I, I saw you. I said, oh, this is a cool dude. I didn't even know you were from Queens. That makes it <laughs> extra special. Um, but, you know, I, I tell people that they have to get out of their comfort zone, that friends are God's gold, right? And that, you know, they, the way I think of it, friendship is this. I look at the world as this big, beautiful place with treasures hidden all over the place. Now, maybe that treasure is a restaurant. Maybe that treasure is a place to go visit. You know, none of us know all the good things. That's why a lot of times when you go to a foreign country, you'll take a tour with a guide, right? And they know because they've been there. They have the treasure map. Right. So friends have their little treasure map that they know where these things are buried. You have yours, and then you can compare and have fun. So, you know, and I just love to laugh. You know, I was a stand-up comedian in New York City. Wow. I was an MC at Woodstock 94. I was a regular at the comic strip. Wow. Uh, I used to live around the corner from it. Um, and I would, you know, I used to work with Chris Rock and, and David Tell and, and the comedians of that vintage. And what, you know, what I miss most about that was the camaraderie. After a show, we'd go up to Dorian's, Dorian's Red Hand. Uh, which was just a few blocks away. We'd have the corner table. And, you know, I would enjoy after the performance more than just even during the performance. But I really do encourage folks to just take a chance on everything. If you don't like your job, get a new job. If you don't like your friends, get better friends, okay? <laughs> Put yourself out there. You know what? Failure 
I mean, look at how many times Edison had to do in order to get the modern light bulb. It was over a thousand, right? Yes, right. And, and then it finally paid off, but have fun along the way. I love that so much, Mike. It, it, you know, it's a real big deal and a real honor for you to bless us today with your presence. We needed that. The Soap is Dope podcast is sometimes we deal with a lot of science and addiction and trauma, and it's good to lighten the mood and to really bring it back to a focal point. So we, I want to thank you on behalf of the whole community. This is a big day for us. Thank you for taking the time out to talk to me. Um, and in closing, can you give us any general advice in your final statements and let the world know where they can find you online? Sure. So you can go to MikeDuffySpeaks.com. You can go to uh, HappinessHallOfFame.com. And you can, you know, I'd encourage you to go to HappinessHallOfFame.com. There is great videos there of people that we've inducted over the years at Stanford University. Um, and uh, you're, you'll, you'll just hear some great content. Uh, it's kind of like TED Talks for Happiness. Um, but I, I wish everybody that hears the sound of my voice a wonderful life. Remember, you are the author of the story of the rest of your life. Make that story one of joy, one of success, one of great excitement, and one of love. Remember that we're all children of God, and we come in all colors, creeds, shapes, and sizes, and we're here to love each other. And by loving each other, you'll have the happy life that you deserve. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. We had Mike Duffy. Thank you all for listening. You're listening to the Soap is Dope podcast. I'm your humble host, Pop Buchanan. I love you all. Go in peace, and I'll catch you guys on the other side. Amen. Take care, Pop. Take care.